Yeah, an update on the routes guidance specifications, which has been part of Open Active um, since around 2019, I think. Uh, we've heard from Ian at National Trust, who was part of that original piece of work. It was before I joined the Open Active Initiative, um, so some some may know more about it than I do. Um, originally, it was looked at as part of our opportunity uh, data model, uh, where we, people would meet up for meetup style walks or guided walks. Um, but then, particularly with COVID, it became clear that there's a there's a use case for self directed activity, and so the the kind of route specification was was created. Um, so, the purpose, of course, help more people get outside, get active. Sport England, who fund Open Active Initiative, are particularly interested because it's free. You know, it doesn't require any special equipment, and it's something that almost everyone can do. So, um, that's a and obviously there's all the health benefits associated so that's why we're here to to kind of progress that that side of the open active specifications and standards um so after the initial development things have gone quiet uh, but we're now seeing quite a bit of interest and we're seeing some implementations in real life so it's a good time to get together and and learn from those experiences other specs working what can we do better can people who are getting into that uh, open data world learn from the previous implementations that kind of thing so i th think we just go straight to i know that national trust have done probably the most bit of work so i don't if we we'll start with you ian if you could just give us a kind of your your take on the story so far and where we are yeah uh what i can cover is i can do the bit uh up to the root specification 1.0 basically um as I said, uh, you haven't done as much since, and that's uh, Luce and Tara will have much more uh, knowledge on that. But I can show you where we've got to, uh, and then it's where we're going is the next is the interesting thing. So can I share a screen? I, I I'll stop presenting. Uh, okay, I'll try. Then oh, where are we? Do a screen. Okay, I've not used Google Meet much, so hopefully that's showing can people see stuff coming through there yeah yep yeah. okay uh so where we were starting off is on our website uh the national Trust website that is uh every property has its own pages and in the activities that walks is a common thing so on our content management system we have a standard way of trying to represent walks uh, the thing is, that it's fairly basic. Uh, it's got the uh, an overview. It's got the information there. Um, it's got a tab with a picture, and it describes the walk, which is all nice. And you can um, where's the there should be a print friendly button somewhere there. So when you click on this, uh, that then allows you to print that out, and you can take out. Which is, I mean, that's all nice. It's all it's all good, but there weren't great standards for what the map is what the how the text is described um and it varied massively properties property uh so what we did uh back in 2018 um we didn't have an inventory of our path so that's all paths on national trust property and what that nature of the path is uh, for access so uh, when i say that i mean whether it's a public right of way whether it's a permissive path uh whether it's encouraged as a path or not uh, she went through a bit of a process and we concluded what we wanted to do uh, was capture all of our paths that exist on national trust properties and tag them whether they were public rights away uh, and largely stop at that to start with um, and in doing so we decided we'd use OpenStreetMap as a product for capturing um, all our paths so what we did we embarked uh, on a process where we spoke to all the rangers um, we had a, a small team of gis data officers to capture the path into open street map uh, what we then did is put uh, we pulled back the paths from open street map and we we present them uh, internally so from that we can say that a path exists and we know whether it's a permissive path or a public right of way which means we can report things like total path length we can also feed that into our mobile app so that we can do path condition inst uh, inspections and we can look at things like the styles, the gates, and we get rangers to uh, look at those. 
and that's great. So we've got a full inventory of our paths uh, on National Trust in OpenStreetMap. So that's open data or openish data and on our internal systems. So the next thing we want to do is, and that's where we're largely at now, is then look at those paths that are then curated into trails, which are the things that are described here. So what we've done is we've tagged those in OpenStreetMap, so as a relation, and uh, now we've got those again. They're they're open. They're an OpenStreetMap. You can pull them back, and we've got we've added things like barriers and attractions. Uh, so that's gates, styles, etc. Now this aligns to the route spec 1.0 that was published in 2019, but it's not exactly the same. Um, things have changed, moved on a bit since then. So we'd got to the stage where we were recording the trail and putting things like gates on it. But where we hadn't really got to is this kind of information, the descriptions, the gradings, the ratings, accessibility criteria. And that's largely uh, where I've stopped doing things on the project and where Taz, uh, in particular as a project manager, has picked up and is working. So we haven't fully implemented the Route 1 specification. Um, it's probably what we've got in the data we have here is probably two thirds of the information about the, the trail is there, but the other bit, particularly grading and accessibility are things that we decided there isn't enough consensus uh, in other providers uh, to take that forward. So having consistency across National Trust is one thing that's great. It means our visitors know if they're going to Killerton or Attingham and they see paths uh, and how we describe them, they know what they're letting themselves in for. So you've got the appropriate people on the appropriate um, trail offering. <laughs> Um, but it'd be much more powerful if that was aligned to other providers, uh, Forestry Commission, local councils, etc. Um, so I don't know if Taz or Luke would like to take things up a bit there of how we are talking to other stakeholders about that. Yeah, yeah. So just yeah, just to add to that, really, sort of, sort of reiterating what he was saying, it's. Um, we're sort of exploring how best to provide that information about the paths what and really questioning what is the information people need in being mindful that we've got an ever-growing audience and demand so we're catering for a wide breadth of people with regards to their needs interests and abilities and so it's very much about providing that information not prescribing so describing the path and not the person or assuming what people can or can't do and in that way we're providing information and then enables people to make informed choices so they can decide for themselves say which path experience they might want on any given day bearing in mind people's needs do change you know sort of quite often um, depending on weather or mood they're in or the group of people they're in or their abilities on that day so we literally have been compiling a whole list of path attributes or descriptors which for example describe the character of the path so it's terrain facilities um information that people might find useful a whole range of things sort of getting on to sort of 80 to 100 sort of different attributes and we're just really exploring as how best do we communicate that so whether that's you know through words symbols icons um, and then a whole suite of tools such as mapping be it paper or digital mapping and, and all the rest of it but with those attributes obviously we we need to make them be able to be transferred digitally and like Ian was saying um, we're also working with a lot of other groups so in putting together that attribute list been talking to numerous other groups and also working very closely with Natural England National Landscape Partnership um, with the aim or looking to explore whether we could come up with some sort of universal language so that the person on the ground then you know whether they're on National Trust land Forestry England private rights away whatever there is this consistent language um, that people can become familiar with so that basically increases their understanding awareness and inevitably their confidence so they actually are fully equipped and confident to go out there and explore further and enjoy more so <clears throat> currently um, at the stage of talking natural england and setting up and bringing together that group of people uh, to really look at those attributes and really decide if that's all the information that people need or what that baseline would be to add to it and like i said what 
how we would actually name those attributes, what would be the final name, and then how that could be interpreted digitally. Lucy, I don't know if you want to add. Uh, only briefly, because that's uh, pretty comprehensive. But I think um, just from my side of things, as, as, as programme manager, have been going around this for quite a number of years, as I think probably the whole industry has. Um, and, and my mission just at the minute is to be shouting scope at the team. Um, so our scope at the moment is um, is narrowed for, the, for this first iteration on walking, running um, and, and promoted routes on the National Trust site. Um, so we're not looking broader than that at the moment, but we are at the same time as keeping the scope tight, making sure we're not excluding other activities, if you see what I mean, it's a bit of a contradiction in terms there, but um, just trying to see if we can nail this bit down first, a um, bit of proof of concept sort of approach, and then we'll look at widening out to broader activities too. I mean, we should also add, we've got specific areas of work that we're working with um, external consultants looking at specifically at maps and the concept of maps and language and how to communicate this. So there's various other elements that we've sort of honed down to that we see as a sort of suite of tools. They all sort of depend on each other, but also they need to stand alone depending on the, the different um, scenarios of the sites, how remote they are and, you know, how, how many facilities they've got. So we are starting to sort of look at those particular areas to sort of feed back into this work too. Excellent. Thank you very much. Lindsay, do you want to jump in there? Yeah, sure. Um, just a quick question. Have accessibility features been thought of on these routes? Yeah, I, th I was going to, well, it's very much, I don't know on this, Ian, on these particular one, the maps that you're showing, but on all our, on all the work we're doing, accessibility overarches everything because, mm -hmm. <clears throat> you know, like I said, You've got a real broad, real broad church of people, community. We're all different in our needs, so um, it's it's basically pairing back right from yeah, all accessibility to everyone and anyone really. No, these it, ones that's showing here don't have the accessibility. There isn't a standard way of representing accessibility in OpenStreetMap that is a uh, agreed upon. I would say there's some things, but it's very difficult. We went to thing let's capture the things first and then when we've got those we can then add on um the accessibility easier but if you don't capture them in the first place it's harder to do that and i think what's added to that is that traditional sort of thing of how do you grade it and that whole thing about easy and strenuous and various ways of doing it symbols numbers um but again it's 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 some information largely behind it you know your easy and my easy is going to be different and so that is that information behind it and providing that information and looking at how succinctly and efficiently we can provide that so that people can quickly make choices as to what is accessible to them and what is not yeah of course accessibility means something different you know to a wheelchair user as it does yeah. to a, someone who's visually impaired so yeah i totally understand yeah, yeah. cool oh I think uh, I I have a query, I suppose, but I, I just wondered if you talked about 80 to 100 attributes. I wondered if you had a, a list you could share or if we could just see some of them up on screen, I guess. I don't know if that's possible. Or, um, or I can, I can uh, just give you an indication. So, like, for example, information might be um, that people need would be anything from, like, parking facilities, toilet facilities. And, and these all have subcategories because, obviously, toilet facilities, for example, can be um, you know, varied, whether it's got baby change, the size, whether for disabled radar cases, all subcategories within this of information, food, drink, how you find out about weather, um, seating, shelter, and then with paths, um, for example, more specific to the nature of the path might be about its start endpoints, destination durations, distance in time, in, in miles, kilometres, and then about gradient barriers, surfacing um and then you're looking at all the different activities so then there's things specific to whether you're walking wheeling dog walking horse riding cycling etc so it basically is has been working with various groups various organizations to really capture what is what is all the information that somebody might need um depending on like i say age ability interest and activity to determine which paths are suitable for their their needs that day and, and so this this has sort of been, like I said, with various groups, internal research um, with other organisations that have been doing similar but slightly different research and pulling all that together and then sort of going back out and testing it. And we're further testing that with our sort of consultant. Um, 
Excellent. And so, um, I mean, I think the hope would be that much of what you described there is already reflected in the in the original um, specification. Um, but I think that we're, we're really interested in in those bits that aren't captured. And you mentioned a few a few earlier. Um, I just wondered if does anyone else have any any comments or questions for the National Trust at this stage? Can I just add quickly one last bit, Howard? Just that um, obviously all of this um, is is amazing, but our big challenge is how we get that data too. So we've kind of got the mission of figuring out what data we want, and then obviously this whole world of how we capture, maintain, share the data, and what have you. But the other slightly critical point of this is how we we get it, and it's um, how we physically capture it. So we've been doing a fair bit of testing on on that, but it's it it is a boots on the ground type job quite often. Um, and we're talking of thousands and thousands of kilometres of, of paths here. So that's the other challenge too, that we're sort of reaching out to other organisations as well and just saying, how do we get this? You know, um, we, we've, we've recruited, or we will be about to recruit another four GIS officers, but, you know, that's four feet on the ground trying to capture a huge amount of information. So learnings there would be great to share too. Yeah. Um, well, I wonder if Daniel had any anything to say on that from that kind of that kind of almost crowdsourced or uh, you know a different model for for collecting information but also as a potential consumer of this data um your, your experiences so you 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 did kind of capture some of the open active uh, root guidance specifications in, in, in your early days on your system but you found that they weren't often populated you know and I, I suppose that's my concern with 80 to 100 plus attributes how, how do we ensure that um, the sufficient data how, how can we make it easier to capture enough data just wondered if daniel or anyone had any thoughts on that yeah i, I just want to say that i'm super excited about all the work the national trust and others are doing and i'm ferociously hungry for the taxonomies and words and you know needs to come into play because from our perspective as we we, we move forward um, and need to push all the solutions ultimately with maybe not collecting the right information or collecting the data we would like which has cost for other our volunteers and for us as well and you know i'd, I'd also like to bring into the conversation ways in which data is like shared in other ways as well um so with makeways a uh, uh, sibling project we worked on we're particularly interested in using Uber's H3 hexagons as a way of capturing accessibility in the landscape. And I think that while the conversation here largely is about routes and paths, I think actually thinking about being able to articulate that the landscape is like underpinning those routes and paths, then means that all organisations that are interested in the paths and routes above that landscape are able to then use that in a more dynamic way. And so I just like entering into the conversation just that idea of the, just the nature of the complexity of a path isn't just much like a person, um, you know, about the route or the line, but actually it's, it's multiple square meters, isn't it, right across that space. And so can we come up with an open standard or use of this, which isn't just about a route, but is actually about using, for example, something like Uber's H3 hexagon bins as a common standard for and providing information. And dare I say as well that depending on the scale of the, the hexagon, actually you might more, want more or less data in terms of the level of granularity that's needed for someone to decide whether or not that space is usable for them or not. And from our perspective, I think the prize there in part as well as to imagine that a lot of the conversation here is about fixed routes and, and trails and paths. But actually if we can allow them to do routing through the landscape and create their own loops or their own trails, um, then that can open up accessibility in other ways as well. But again, that would demand having an understanding of what's happening either between the connectivity between paths and routes or the underpinning landscape. Um, so that, this is some more complexity for us to enjoy this conversation. Uh, I think um, you gave me a, a quick demonstration of the kind of hexagon model um, I don't know. Are you able to? Are you able to do that? Are you able to share screen and, and give that? I can see you, you're possibly mobile, so you might not be able to do that. Yeah, I'm, I'm at a train station right now. That's quite hard <laughs> to do that. And but people can look at it, right? And it's um, it's a pilot. We we'll stop promoting it because there, there's something not right with it. We want to we want to 
fix and get right before we go to the next stage. But if you look at makeways.org and just look at walking, and you kind of see what we're starting doing there, it actually does a bit the opposite to what Taz said, because it does go from the perspective of the user. So, for example, is this route good for someone who's wearing white trainers, for example? And I think it's a fair number of people who might want to walk a route because they want to keep their trainers clean. But we specifically wanted to develop makeways into a place where people are literally painting onto the landscape what the physical landscape is like underneath as well. We just haven't got there that far yet. So while when you look at makeways, it's, it's about people's opinions of use. Imagine, I mean, I'm a geographer, and if anyone else is a geographer here, colouring in the landscape is what geographers do, right? You might have to colour in different hexagons in terms of the, the geology, uh, the, you know, the physical surface quality of the land. If we can do that at that level, then I think that can unlock an awful lot for us. Um, I know we've shared this stuff with free in terms of organised principles, but there'll be GIS professionals on the call that might have good reasons to push back against what I'm saying. But I think it's a, an interesting angle to have in the conversation. Well, um, I've got um, uh, Ian. Do you have anything else to share? I, I could I could just very quickly um, put that up on the screen to, just to bring Daniel's point to life. Which is uh, an interesting. I can end sharing then. Okay. What do I do? Just stop sharing. Do you can take over? Yeah. Oh, there you go. <laughs> um, let me just just bring what Daniel's saying to life. Hopefully, you can see that. Can you see that now? Yeah. Um, so this is the idea of um, these hexagon shapes, where you can actually describe accessibility or the or the landscape itself. And you can see that that one's following a track. So very different um, to what we're talking about here in the, in the open active route specification or route guide specification. But I just thought that's an interesting thing to see um, and to consider. The reason why it, 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 the, the flip way of looking at that is that the way we see it with slow ways and things like national trails and things is if, if something is being surveyed or reviewed, um, as a certain standard across multiple hexagons is in the line, then you can then light up all the hexagons as saying, well, we know that the whole of that trail behaves in this way. And then other people can then use that. If you zoom out further as well, you can see that there's other places in the country that have been done in more detail, but also it creates an articulation of um, what's happening spatially across the wider landscape in terms of accessibility as well. So it, it has other benefits. Anyway. Very interesting. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that. Um, OK, so I'm going to try now to get back to. To this, um, I think so <clears throat> that was National Trust. We've got. Um, we also have British Cycling. I, I don't know. Miss Lindsay out twice. <laughs> do, you, do you want to give us an update on, on um, on your work on your interest here so the same as sort of i mentioned at, at the start i uh want to create a a map a product a service where um if if you are a disabled person and you use a non-standard cycle you could know that 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 route is uh completely accessible so for me it's defining what accessibility means like the conversation we're having with the, the national trust because that means something very different if you're riding a tandem um to whether you're riding a hand cycle so a lot of our uh cycle routes currently might have chicane barriers or they could have gates or you know so if i'm riding my standard bike um i might be able to meander through it but if i'm a wheelchair user and i've got a larger wider uh type of bike um i'm not going to be able to chicane around that or if i'm visually impaired and i'm riding on the back of a tandem with a uh a pilot um also, it's a longer bike, very difficult to get through that chicane. So yeah, I would like to create <clears throat> something, uh, some sort of mapping product, etc. We already have routes. I, I'm not closely linked to that project. I'm about disability and inclusion. So my projects are slightly separate, but uh, whether it's integrated into what we already have, whether it's embedded into other people's systems, like I just, yeah, hear from to sort of... Okay continue the uh, accessibility drum um you know this makeways website i've never seen before but it looks great but uh you know it doesn't it, cycling it, it, it does, is, does that count account for people on different types of bike uh yeah that's sort of 
That's why I'm so, here. Just, just to clarify for my understanding, so you've got some roots already. Um, are, are they shareable, or is there an intention to to make those kind of op open data accessible, which is the, you know the kind of <clears throat> I guess so. Yeah. So we have a separate pro product called Let's Ride, um, and within Let's Ride, there are user-generated routes. Um, so I I would love to be able to get to a point where they're open data friendly. But open data, I'm I'm not the data person in VC. I'm the accessibility person. So I'm sort of here to learn and understand what I need to produce uh, when I come to producing routes. I, so when I when I have my accessible routes, whatever that standard is and looks like and whomever I'm working with, it's National Trust, Forestry England, Sir Strands, Slowways, whomever it might be, you know, what I would love to get to is there's some organization somewhere, Activity Alliance, Sport England, whomever, saying this is what the, the standard for accessibility. This is exactly what it means. Mark your roots. If you know if you've got roots and, and they fit, great. Um, if that can tie in with uh, open data, amazing. Yeah, we do. There was, or it is, or was a feed from British Cycling. I think an open active, uh, open data feed. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think it has. I think there are a couple of issues with it. We need to kind of follow up separately with with your data person. I think. Okay. To follow that. Uh, I know yeah, what, I, I have a program so. which is clubs, uh, which is club based. And I know when we were trying to make our data open data accessible, the challenge we had is so if a club were to, a club might not have a specific location, right? So if there's a club run, a club would say to me, like, yeah, we just meet at a different cafe every weekend because that's what people want to do. They want to go out and cycle and they want to meet in different places. So for that club, like some clubs don't have a home. So mm -hmm. that that becomes very difficult to to make open data friendly. That was my experience in my sort of tiny part of British cycling. That's interesting and good feedback. Um, just making a note. Um, okay, so. Move on, I think to, to Ben, did you want, do you have a an open data story? Um, we're not really using it open data at the minute, um, but we want to, we've got uh, various ways of, um, sort of plotting uh, paddles that people do. A lot of them are, well, most of the ones that we've got are user generated, but we've got our own sort of Paddle UK um, proper trails, if you like. And yeah, we're looking at ways of, getting this into open data and giving more feedback into what's along the way, what can people expect? Um, and also at different states of, um, well, condition, because um, when you're paddling, if it's, if the river is very high, it's a very different experience to a different time of year. And can we, you know, present that to the users um, in a meaningful way? So that's where we are at the minute. We're sort of trying to plan how we're gonna do it, um, but want to do it in a standard way. Excellent. Really interesting. Um, I think probably have I missed anyone else by the way? I just need it. I don't know. No, I don't think I have this time. That's good. Um so I think if we'll probably move on to or oh, I'll I will give an update on um on another another implementation or another um, piece of work that's going on which is just to get my notes oops or not yeah so the stream initiative I don't know if you've, you've heard of this but this is um this is an initiative in the water sector to share data and that could be data around um, storm overflows, water data quality, all those kind of things. But they're using a um, an ArcGIS platform to share share the data. Um, and they're on this open data journey, so they're exploring what other kind of data they can share. So a lot of these facilities might be a reservoir, we'll have, we might have activities on the water, but it might have um, grounds or, or walking routes around. So they're, they're exploring that. They're all at different stages. Some of them have bookable activities, uh, which you know was the original kind of 
use case of open active making it easy for someone to search and discover an activity and book on it straight away there and then in you know through this world of open data um but not all of them have uh, bookable activities some of them just have these self-directed root kind of activities so they're going to start there which they feel is probably an easier uh route <laughs> shouldn't say that an easier um place to make a start in the open data journey so um obviously they're also interested in learning from from other experiences i think national trust from what we've heard is is the most most advanced in um, in their project um so we have wessex water um yorkshire water welsh water uh seven trent and northumbrian uh, but i think they're all looking at sharing um relatively static information about routes that are available on each of their sites um and so they're looking at the original uh, version one of the root guidance specification but we're keen to learn if there are things from integrating with OpenStreetMap um, that could be updated in that specification, then we're, we're keen to kind of, this is a good time to do that before they get any further in their implementations. Um, Darren, Tim, is there anything you want to add at this point? Uh, no, nothing in particular comes to mind. Fair enough. No, same for me. Same for you, Tim. Okay. Um, in that case, I think we're probably. Uh, I think it would probably be, be interesting to talk about timelines and um, things again. Oh, sorry, did uh, there was a ping? Sorry, hold on, just wait. A minute. Can I just play a new girl card here that I don't really know about you guys and just essentially what it is as an organisation or how you're connected in with Sport England? So sorry if this is out of context a little bit, but I just wonder if you could just give a super quick no, top one no, just pull no. all together. Thanks. Um, so the history of of the Open Active Initiative, um, well, Tim, do you want to do you want to tell the story? I've been here longer than me. Well, I guess uh, maybe we should we should introduce ourselves as the the Open Data Institute as well. So, um, Open Data Institute or uh, ODI for short, because Open Data Institute is a bit of a mouthful. Um, it has been around for just over ten years, and it was founded by Tim Berners Lee and uh, Sir Nigel Shabbol. Um And essentially, we work with all sorts of organisations around both the UK and in other countries around the world um, to build better data ecosystems, data infrastructure, um, improve data practices and um, improve data literacy um, and just help to make uh, a world where data works better for, for everyone. Um, and as the name suggests, uh, we try and make uh, the case for open uh, for data being as open as as possible as well but we do understand that there are some very valid reasons why some data shouldn't necessarily be open and should be um should have some protections and, and some uh, some privacy and and things around that um so that's uh, the odi as an organization and uh, and about six or seven years ago and um, we got involved with the open active initiative uh, sort of from the beginning um and uh, to date, it has been uh, pretty much entirely funded by Sport England um, and Sport England uh, provides funding to the ODI to have a small team of us to help steward uh, the initiative. So um, our role involves a kind of technical side, um, which uh, includes maintaining the uh, standards and the specifications and, and the kind of uh, technical tools and things um, which help people to use that use the standards and, and specifications um, and we also have some roles in in um, running and maintaining and, and providing sort of uh, secretariat uh, support for some of the governance uh, around the open active initiative so things like the the steering committee and some of the community groups we run um, and we also do some work uh, in terms of kind of outreach uh, so engaging with new organizations um, convening uh, meetings like uh, today's meeting and to get people together um, and support people who want to adopt open active uh, and use the open active infrastructure and the open active uh, specifications 
uh, did I miss anything, Howard or Darren? No, I would, I would just say that so since those over the six to seven years, we've grown from a small handful of early adopters to um, there are now over 300 data feeds and around 5 million opportunities live out there. So that's an opportunity to book a squash court, to go on a yoga class, those kind of things. So that's the kind of, um, the, it's a, you know, a, we're growing this, this digital open data kind of opportunity to, to kind of help people get active by, by getting the data out there, it creates, helps people to create applications that reach new audiences and motivate them in, in different ways to get, to get healthy. So Lindsay, you had a, a follow up question, maybe. Yeah. Um, sorry. I think, uh, I think it's all fantastic. Um, I think where possibly as sports there's a challenge is sports are, are funded by Sport England to do our core business um, and I just wonder potentially if there's a bit of a, a comp like why like I wonder if a barrier as to why open data aren't getting the information or the data or the traction or the user on other sports or organizations websites is because maybe Sport England need to say to other people like these guys are doing it we're funding them to do it you don't need your own club finder paddle point which i think is brilliant by the way uh ben um you know if, if everyone is off doing their own thing i appreciate you're trying to bring it all together but it it feels like sport england are like almost funding too many people to do the same thing i don't know if that's your experience if someone just said stop doing it these guys we're funding them to do it they take lead now and then that's when you can get your standards and things like that or have i sort of misunderstood the point entirely no i sometimes um i, I can understand the point we're, we're not i think it's probably we as an initiative are, are not really delivering the services that an activity finder provided we're encouraging people to make that data open so that yeah people in the marketplace can can um can can provide those services um so i think that there's, there's that side of it um i sometimes wish Sport england could do more to kind of make um as you say they're funding ngbs or organizations or other yeah. people they've funded come on board into yeah. in line with it yeah Somehow, yeah, I would yeah. Agree. yeah. You know. but i mean okay. as you say they're funded to do the core businesses and over covid and and various things that that's been a challenge um you know no doubt we also have this the kind of the challenge in the sector of it it's data digital it's not um you know it might be not comfortable territory for for some people in in, in the sector mm -hmm. i guess the, the digital and data literacy i suppose is which in in almost every sector is a challenge um so that's not you know singling out this sector uh, Tara, did you want to say something? Yeah, sorry. So it was just a, a th about three or three things, really. So firstly, then, because um, yeah, obviously I'm familiar with the whole Sports England setup with yourselves. So the money that Sports England pay for you for this open active initiative, I, is that covering this work you're doing today and the work in developing, or is this a separate piece of work that you're, you know, are you sort of putting two side by side? So I mean, is it all still part of that funded? sports england covered um, it is we the we see the um you know our, we're funded to develop uh, the specifications for for the sector for, to, to try and encourage people to get more active through the sharing of, of data information about opportunities to get active um and so working on the root specification we've we, comes under that heading um it's and i think from discussions with, with sport england it's seen as a, an important area to to progress so in progressing this work are you you're not needing or seeking organizations to contribute resources funding sort of thing you feel that's covered or is like that's what i mean um well that's i suppose we're getting on with the resources that we've got and trying to make things happen so uh, undoubtedly um if there is more funding available we could do more 
Tim, I don't know if this, this you know, stepping into the use case kind of uh, communities in the work, some of the work you've been doing. Yeah, I guess so. I mean, I, I, it's probably um, it's sort of uh, our boss, so to speak, uh, Andrew, who's probably that would be better placed to, to fill these kind of questions. Um, I think I, I pretty much just uh, re reiterate what Howard just said that, that you know, we, we have funding to do a certain amount, but you know we are a small team and that, that we only have limited time <laughs> available so there's only so much we can do and, and only so much support we can provide and um, so more, more funding can potentially increase what uh what resource we have available and and uh you know other colleagues and things that might be able to support as well um but yeah well you know we, we are able to um to uh help develop and maintain the, the specifications um with, with the funding and the resourcing that sport sporting can give us to, to an extent <laughs> it is a, is a bit of a blurry line so it's not an easy um question to answer there's a there's a bit of a blurry line of how how far our support can stretch i mean sorry. okay so, sorry it's a bit of a woolly mean... answer but... <laughs> No, that's, that's, that's great. Thanks. I mean, this sort of relates to those sort of next steps in a way, because I'd be interested to know who was on your steering committee and who your outreach of organisations are in the sense that <clears throat> that's sort of running parallel in a way with what we're doing at the Trust in our work with Natural England and other organisations. And for us, with our attributes, our next stage is really to agree our attributes. Like I said, you know, it doesn't mean we can't always add to them, but agree that they are the right list or a very good baseline, which we're pretty certain it is. I mean, it's been tested and tested and tested. So I feel like, you know, there's only so much testing you can do. But the next stage then <clears throat> is to really agree and finalize the terminology. So how each one of those attributes are termed, which from the brilliant sort of training of Ian internal National Trust is necessary in developing any sort of schema. Um, and then also ensuring that um, that the appropriate technology or methodology is used so that it's universal, because obviously, you know, this is talking about everyone from charitable groups to government bodies. So so it'd be really interesting to know your steering group and who you collaborate with. And in, in when I'm taking that back to my conversations to sort of try and progress, you know, how that might work with the ODI sort of feeds into your next steps in a way. Certainly, yeah. Um, and we can share that the. the details of the steering committee they're, they're on the open active website um so i think yeah i mean, I mean the, what you're talking about there is the uh, that piece of work around moving from a specification to a standard you know which is which is part of what the odi has done over the years in in, in different different sectors and different initiatives um about convening a community of, of publishers and users and um reaching consensus on, on, on all those kind of challenges. Um, so, yeah, it'll be interesting to, to, to pick that up, I think. Yep. Uh, and what about, I was interested in timelines, I think, for, for, for the piece of work, if if we've got a, I think we've spoken in, in the past that you're, you know, you're hoping to pilot some of the, um, the more complete path um and trail descriptions uh, route guidance kind of implementations is that still the case yeah i mean lucy probably add in various other things and in about like auditing and like i say gathering up information but yeah that <laughs> now over the next sort of um 11 months it's pulling all this together it's that external work with agreeing the um terminology but then also retesting once and for all all those attributes but then all those other tools and how they work together and like i said key to that is that that content that language and then all the different means of efficiently conveying that information you know in meeting all those different needs and abilities of people but yeah lucy i didn't know if you want to add no i think that pretty much sums it up i think we're just working our way through it as we've sort of talked through the call of understanding what it is we're we're trying to gather how we describe it and how we physically get it and then how we share it so yeah across the piece really so yeah it'd be really interesting to know kind of what what you guys tangibly would like out of, of this or how you know well i think um it's it's just really interesting to see that um 
to see the data taking shape. I think you know in in its it, in its various formats um, to compare how that would would sit alongside. Let's let's say someone's built an activity finder for a local authority. Um, they know there's yoga in this village hall, there's a gym, and there's things. Is it is it how would presenting routes you know alongside that information how would it work i think that's that would be interesting to see uh you know and then we get down to the detail of the detail of that accessibility um information and we're trying to move forwards there in describing and, and again arriving at a consensus on how you can describe accessibility when it means so many different things to different people uh, you know what what steps forward can we take it's a, a difficult nut to crack you know for everybody but can we can we make some kind of steps forward in how we describe these things and report on uh, if we can improve the number of open active opportunities that include all that accessible information to help someone make a decision if an activity is right for them those would be um good steps forward I'm not sure if that, uh, hopefully that answers your question. Phil or Francis? So yeah, I'm just, I suppose there's two things, isn't there? Because you're talking about kind of activity. So if you take the yoga class, that's an activity, but then you're talking about roots and side. So is it that you're looking for, you know, how, you know, is that route to that yoga class, for example, suitable for, you know, accessibility? You know, what sort of accessibility does that route to the yoga class have, for example? Um, I, 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 well, yeah, I'm just trying to say how they both match up. Yeah, well, I think I hadn't really, hadn't really considered in terms of um, the route being, <laughs> linking those, those two things together, uh, that kind of active travel kind of, um, approach which is a is a separate challenge i think uh, i'm i'm simply saying that uh, if in an activity finder there are activities which have got a date and a time and they might have a cost or uh, but there's also a set of activities that you can do for free whenever it suits you more or less um and so how can we get those opportunities in front of the people through these through these Activity Finder tools. Um, that's that's more how I was I was looking at it because we know that there's, there's already a, you know an existing uh, market or marketplace for for those kind of tools and users that that uh, that look for and find activities in that way. Can we get them to consider walking or cycling routes that uh, that they might not have thought of to help them get active? Okay, yeah, fair enough. I was just thinking, like, if it was, let's say, if you're going to have this big database full of activity from, like, where your gyms is, where your swimming pool is, where your yoga classes are, and all that sort of it, a lot of people know where their sports centre is or their church or wherever, but actually the challenge is how the route to there and actually how do you get there yeah. by walking, how do you get there through cycling? That's... Yeah, that's really interesting. I think and so the tools for for that kind of active travel are um, we're almost a bit into um, into the the world that Daniel was talking about there with the um, if you can understand the terrain or the landscape the barriers between you or where you work and, and where you, you know the activity is happening, you could um, it's a kind of geospatial routing challenge there, isn't it? Lucy? Lucy, you're muted. <laughs> oh man, honey chocolate. Um, uh, so I was just, just thinking, is it helpful for us? And, and please forgive me if I'm going off piste here a little bit, but we've got this whole world going on around establishing the attributes and, and granted we're doing it within a bit of a scope, but you know that, that can be widened and, uh, as needs be. But um, particularly in the world of, uh, that Taz is sort of leading on around bringing organisations together to look at those attributes. And obviously we've got this whole bit of work around then how do we capture that data? <clears throat> is that something that 
make sense for, for us as an organisation to, to carry on and, you know, and everyone welcome at this party, I suppose, is, is the open invite really in terms of helping shape this. We, we're only going to have change if we do it collectively. But, but and I kind of understand that and we can carry on merrily with that. Um, is that what you're looking for from this sort of conversation as to how we kickstart and or keep that piece of work flowing? And then I suppose what I'm still, forgive me for asking this, but I'm still not 100% sure is how you guys come in or want to come in or, you know, how does it all connect together? I think it's, it's about helping, um, you see, you've got to focus on walking and, and running, um, but we know that there's interest elsewhere in, in canoeing and cycling. Um, so it's about understanding the the boundaries of that narrow scope that you've you've taken and where there might be overlaps with other other forms of walking um so that's one of the challenges you know is is not um you know is is meeting your needs but not excluding the, the potential needs of others you know and understanding how a standard or a specification can be flexible in that way and it's also about helping you, you're dealing with a great number of organizations absolutely um but you know again just trying to help test not test the the implementation or the adoption of, of those standards and the, their use in in other tools you know once it's available as open data um does it support new use cases new new applications new new ways to help people get active I think that's where we would we would hope to to um things we could explore you know okay I, I, yeah, um, I so yeah if, we, if i paraphrase that a bit so i think where it comes in is what you really want is a specification from us and when i say us that means the people in this group and others the people who are interested in routes be that um horses bikes uh, walking running to say this is a specification of the information that we think is needed to describe what our product being the activity is a leisure activity is <laughs> um, and then you could uh, codify that into a, a, a standard and once it's there then we're looking to have a way to people to uh, produce things into that standard so that others can consume including open and active with the attributes so it's a way to then share that information and as you say you can share it in an open way then the uh, supply chain with its apps and its things can innovate with that information and present it to their specific focus audiences is that sort of where we're at that's yeah that's exactly right Ian much better than I badly explained it <laughs> so it, it's about moving towards um a specification that works that can, can be can be used more generally um and that you know, in time can be implemented and adopted as a standard so that um it just makes it easier for people um you know to, to, to start if they can follow a specification and follow a recipe uh, to help get their information out there and build that richer kind of world of opportunities to go out and do something healthy and active. Yeah, and I think what was um, impressed before the Roots 1 is uh, when you probably got quite scared when we said, you know, 100 attributes, 1800 attributes, you probably go, Wah. but of course, you've got a minimum specification for a standard, the absolutely essential things that must be included for a route, and then they're extendable. Uh, and that's what I like before is how the root specification one you could extend. So if it's, you have a very uh, specific thing like the side you mentioned with tandem bikes, it's not going to be applicable everywhere uh, because you only really want to look at things where bikes are allowed, for instance, on routes. And then that community that serves those trails can go into a lot of detail on the attributes that are important to them. And they don't need to worry about a lot of the other attributes because it's not the bits they're interested in. <laughs> so it's who curates those routes to get to the level of detail they can provide to their more detailed audiences. But in general, you can find out there is a route that might be suitable in the first place. I think so. And so it, that's, yeah, I think it, it can look daunting when you look at the version one spec, the, the amount of things that it can cover, but it, that's the idea to be, to give it that flexibility. Um, but I think there's, there's a job to do in creating that guidance to help people 
um, understand yeah. where the root, where the, the specifications can be can be flexed, um, and to help people understand how to handle a data feed that that takes different sh sizes and shapes. You know, I think that's what we've learned from some of the some of the other open active work. Um, Particularly in, from the early days of the implementation, this is the, the find and book for a gym class or, or a yoga session kind of thing. Um, that given so much flexibility, it can be hard to, you lose the kind of the standardness, if you like, of it, the uh, the consistency, um, which makes it difficult to then in, bring all that data together. So I think we could learn a bit from, from the, the first set of open active implementations and hopefully bring that learning to kind of hope in hone in at an early stage on on the right amount of flexibility and the right guidance to help people um use that wisely okay i think we're we're probably oh, we're over anyway so um thank you thank you very much everyone that has been uh, really interesting um and it's a, an exciting space and hopefully we can we can move on. Um, I'll have to have a kind of digest, I think, in the next steps, and uh, I'll 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 follow up with an email. But Tara, do you, did you want to say something? Yeah, yeah, no, that's right. We're going to follow. It's just exactly that. So, what happens next? Because um, yeah. obviously, we're much really carrying on this, and and I would say that the people from the different organisations um, on the call today, please, you know, get in touch because it'd be great to feed in. We have got representations from your organisations, but obviously things you've said today obviously resonate so please do get in touch and either be yourselves or people you recommend in your organizations that will talk to me about those attributes and what we're developing here that would be really good so um in in sort of really thrashing those out and getting the right terms and, and agreeing all that but yeah how it if that was it then it's about um i think there's sort of understanding that your sort of objective around that and the steering group and collaborating with and then how to work alongside and then together on this would be some more clarity on that would be really useful absolutely i think and you know you you, you mentioned it before and tim mentioned it we're a small team it's, it's it's working out how much we can do with the resource we've got to support the, you know this area keeping it moving forward um but it's, not, it's those things that you just mentioned bringing people together helping to agree the the word in the language the attributes the data model whatever um just reaching consensus and hopefully driving driving it forward Fantastic. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Cheers, everyone. Thank you very much. Been a pleasure. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Bye. -bye. Bye.